The reading this morning is from 1 Kings 19, verses 1 to 18, and it's on page 361 of the Church Bible. Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done, and now how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there, while he himself went a day's journey into the desert. He came to a broom tree, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the tree and fell asleep. All at once an angel touched him and said, Get up and eat. He looked around, and there by his head was a cake of bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then lay down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank. Strengthened by that food, he travelled for forty days and forty nights until he met, reached Horeb, the mountain of God. Then he went into a cave and spent the night. And the word of the Lord came to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, broken down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. The Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain, and in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant and broken down your altars and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. The Lord said to him, Go back the way you came and go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Hazel king over Aram. Also anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, king over Israel, and anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from Abel Mahola, to succeed you as prophet. Jehu will put to death any who escape the sword of Hazael, and Elisha will put to death any who escape the sword of Jehu. Yet I reserve 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal, and all whose mouths have not kissed him. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Ruth. Father God, we just thank you for Rachel for coming here and delivering this your word to us. We pray that you breathe life into your living word. May you anoint her and bless her. And may you, Lord, be working in our hearts by your spirit. Soften our hearts and open our minds to the gospel, Lord. May we feed upon it, may we hear upon it. Fill it and may you bless us. And in all things, Lord, we pray that your word be found be in our lives and the lives of this church. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. Oh, it is a real joy. Oh, hello. <laughs> Um, it's a real joy to be with you this morning, and uh, okay, I'll just move myself. 
I'll swap that, I'll swap signs, and I can still see what I'm looking at. It's a real joy to be with you this morning. Um, as Dean said, I'm, I come down from Stopsy Baptist Church to be with you this morning, and uh, it's been, actually, I was looking at my notes, it's actually been... Uh, So there may be well a few of you who don't actually know who I am. Um, so for 27 years, um, and in that time I've had quite a few different roles. Um, currently, I'm on the eldership. Um, I help to lead our Alpha course. I also help to lead something called Discover, which is a course that we created back in 2015. Um, I sing in the worship team and I occasionally preach. So um, church is pretty busy. <laughs> um, but outside of that, I'm a primary school teacher. I've been doing that for 15 years. Um, and I currently teach year two in a local primary school in Luton, which I absolutely love. Um, and uh, one of the keys to my, I suppose, to teaching, really, is communication. Being able to communicate well. And I'm sure you're very aware, living in Luton, we have a wide variety of nationalities, of cultures represented, and languages as well. And it is very, very common for new children to arrive in this country and in my classroom without a word of English, which can make teaching incredibly tricky. <laughs> and that was the case a couple of weeks ago. I, I was told I had a new little boy starting with me, and uh, he only spoke Italian. And my Italian is nil, um, and I thought, this is going to be fun. Um, but not to worry, because I, I told my class, I said, we've got this little boy coming, you know, he speaks Italian. And this other little, little lad piped up and said, no Italian, do not worry. He said, I can speak Italian. I thought, oh, great, the problems are over. Fantastic. I said, can you? Because I was thinking, I'm not sure you can, but, you know, I'll go with this. I said, okay, can you? He said, yes, I can say all kinds of food words. I said, yes, like what? Pizza. Okay, right, still got a problem then. Anyway, as it turns out, it's actually been okay. Um, and actually, this little lad understands a lot more English than I was, I was worrying that he would, so it's been really, really good. But, um, you know, under listening to people, understanding them is, is key to relationship in life, and it is absolutely the same when it comes to our relationship with God. And we're going to be looking at this topic of the God who speaks um, through the story of Elijah's encounter with God in 1 Kings 19. And we're going to look at the conversation between God and one of his servants and hopefully draw some parallels to our own lives this morning. And thank you so much, Jane, for reading that for us. It was uh, brilliant. Thank you. And we're, what, basically what I'm going to do is we're going to explore it in a couple of chunks. Um, we'll start with verses 1 to 9, look at that, and then kind of move on from there. But I think it's really important to kind of set the scene um, behind what's going on in this particular passage. And there are key people in this story. The first one is obviously Elijah. We have God, we have Queen Jezebel, and we have King Ahab. And uh, if you know anything about Bible history, you will know that King Ahab was a new low in evil. Since the times of Solomon and David, it had just gone on a nosedive in terms of following God and looking to him for how that country should be run. And when Ahab arrived on the scene, he then married Jezebel, who, whose name has gone down in history as a notorious name for evil. And quite clearly, she wore the pants in that relationship. I think it's safe, safe to say. But the background to this particular event in 1 Kings 19, of course, is chapter 18, which is the um, encounter that um, Elijah has between himself and the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. And it's in that event where he, 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 um, he sees one of the greatest revivals in Jewish history. Basically, after challenging the people to choose who they're going to serve. He mocks the prophets of Baal. They end up, um, as they're trying to get Baal to kind of light this offering in front of them, it isn't working. And obviously God comes through and he completely obliterates um, the offering that's given to him. And as a result, um, the 450 Baal prophets are slaughtered. And it's a pretty dramatic response. And the people turn back to God as a result of seeing that. But we're told in verse 1 that King Ahab, when he got home, he told Jezebel everything, including what um, had happened to the prophets of Baal. But it's interesting, he said it, what Elijah had done. There's absolutely no mention of God whatsoever. It's all Elijah's fault. And another translation says that he gives, he gives a detailed account of what he'd witnessed. And immediately, Jezebel's response is that she sends a threat towards Elijah's life. 
And Elijah's response is that he runs. Now, in an ideal world, he should have been quite fired up, really. I mean, when you think about where he's just come from, what he's just seen, what he's just witnessed, he should have recalled the power of God he'd seen just a few hours earlier and thought, do you know what? That's nothing. It's not a problem. My God can come through for me. I don't need to be frightened of this woman. It's really easy to say, with hindsight, what Elijah should have done. Have you ever experienced a come down from a spiritual high? I mean, I know I have. If you've been to a conference, you've been on a weekend away, you've been on a Christian camp or something like that, and it's just, you come home, you're all fired up, and it's like, yes, God's the best thing ever. This is amazing. The Christian life is brilliant, and I love it. And then all of a sudden, the challenge of life comes up against that. And everything you felt just a few moments earlier seems to evaporate in the face of what is in front of you. And fear just seems to take over. And Elijah is so terrified of what he thinks Jezebel is capable of that he forgets the power of God and he only sees the threat of another human being. And so he decides to run. So we're told that he goes off into the wilderness all by himself. He sits down under this tree and he just says to God, you know what, I've had enough. I don't want to do this anymore. Just, just kill me, please. You know, just get this over and done with. This guy is totally depressed. He's completely exhausted. And basically, he's saying to God, you know what? She's going to kill me anyway. And quite frankly, if I had a choice, I'm pretty certain you could do it in a nicer way than she would. So if I'm going to choose, I'd much rather you did it. But God's response is gracious and is loving. He doesn't take Elijah's life, but he, he does the complete opposite. He actually sustains it by cooking for him giving him water to drink, and allowing him to sleep. And God goes through the process twice. There's no thunder, there's no lightning, there's no judgment, there's no conversation even, actually. God doesn't even actually speak to him at this point. He simply provides for Elijah's needs, and he allows him to recover from what he's just been through. And to me, you know, when I read that, I just think this is evidence of the fact that God loves us deeply. I mean, we know that. We we know, we see it all the way through scripture. We know that. But this is just real tangible evidence of the way in which God provides and he just loves us so, so much. And Psalm 121 verses 5 and 7 say, The Lord himself watches over you. The Lord stands beside you as your protective shade. The Lord keeps you from all harm and watches over your life. Which is exactly what he does for Elijah. So when we're in need, if we cry out to him, he meets us where we are. We can be absolutely 100% certain of that. That's exactly what he's going to do. But Elijah's response to God's provision, again, isn't what you expect. You know, I think there's absolutely no evidence of any gratitude whatsoever. At no point does he say, thank you, God, for providing me with that food, with that opportunity to rest. Thank you for that. There's absolutely none of that. He despite the fact that he has had this opportunity to rebuild some, some of his strength and to kind of have a bit of, a bit of me time, I suppose, for want of a better phrase, he still isn't in the right frame of mind. He still isn't recognizing what God has done for him. But he is strengthened to make the journey to Mount Horeb, which is otherwise the other name for Mount Sinai, which is the mountain of God. Um, and, you know, he met with God on one mountain, on Mount Carmel, and he's now on a journey to go and meet with God on another mountain. And he has 40 days and 40 nights to make this journey from one mountain to another. And if you know anything about um, the importance of numbers in the Hebrew Scriptures, then you might know that the number 40 is associated with an extended period of trial and testing. And it's very Moses-like. So you've got that number will appear... you know, it appears all the way through the Bible. So you get it, obviously, with the Israelites, 40 years in the, in the wilderness walking through. You get it with Jesus being tested and tempted and, and um, fasting for 40 days in, in the wilderness as well. And then, of course, you have this with um, Elijah. And it's this time when it, times are hard and a person's faith is tested. So Elijah has 40 days and 40 nights of silence. Can you imagine that? 40 days and 40 nights of absolute silence. There is no conversation with God at all. He's had, he just has time to brood, to worry, to question what's happened to him. But there's absolutely no response from God at all. 
And perhaps that's you this morning. Perhaps you're in a, in a place of extended trial. Perhaps you have found yourself in a place where you've been asking God something for a very long time and apparently there is no answer. There is no response to the questions that you cry out. Well, good news. God wants to meet with you. He wants to hear your heart. He wants to meet with you. And he wants to get to the bottom of what it is that's troubling you. So when Elijah gets to the mountain, he finally meets with God on a one-to-one level. But verse 9 tells us, the Lord said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? So if Elijah was under the impression that this was, he was about to have an easy conversation with God, that really wasn't the best start. And when I, was, when I was preparing this and looking at this, I thought to myself, well, what's the emphasis in this question? You know, he says, God says to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? Because where you place the emphasis, which word you emphasize in a, in a, in a sentence or in a question, makes a massive difference to the meaning of what it is that you're actually trying to communicate. And eventually I decided that it was the word here. So what are you doing here, Elijah? In other words, I didn't, you're in the wrong place. I didn't ask you to come here. I didn't ask you to come to this particular place. And it doesn't mean that Elijah isn't welcome in God's presence. We know that. We know that we're welcome in God's presence. He wanted time with Elijah. But quite often, and I'm sure you'll, you'll recognize this in your own life, quite often how we think something ought to work out isn't God's way of doing it. Isaiah tells us that. My ways are higher than your ways. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. God and me, God and you, we don't think the same. (laughs) We don't do it the same way. As much as we would love it if God sometimes did it our way. (laughs) Because quite often we think the path from A to B is in a straight line. And we think, yep, that's the quickest way of doing it. God, do it that way and I'll be absolutely fine. (sighs) Actually, you know, A to B is quite often through T, F, G, I, J, And the thing about those journeys with God is that it's actually about, it's more than just about getting from A to B. It's actually about forming your character. And it's about honing those bits off of the side and chipping things away from you and forming you to be more like the character of his son, Jesus Christ. So why why does God question Elijah? I mean, surely he already knew the answer. Surely he already knew why Elijah was there. But actually, the thing about this is that it's about God demanding honesty from Elijah. And when we come into God's presence, he wants honesty from us. He wants us to have a conversation with him, even though he already knows exactly everything you're going to say. He already knows. But he wants to hear it from you because you're his child. You're precious to him. He wants to have that conversation with you. And so... Because he has the opportunity, Elijah decides to make his case. And actually, when you read verse 10, you can actually, I think you can hear Elijah's anger and his justification for being where he is. I've zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you. They've torn down your altars. They've killed every one of your prophets. I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. I mean, do you notice the problem with Elijah's perspective? It's pretty self-righteous. It's pretty self-pitying. You know, basically what he's saying to God is, you want to know why I'm here? Seriously? (laughs) Well, okay. Well, okay, number one, I have served you in a way that very few other people have. That's, That's a tick in the box as far as I'm concerned. Number two, the people of Israel have turned their backs on you, so they're not paying attention. Don't know why I should be bothering doing the job you've given me to do anyway. Have they, actually? I mean, you think back to where he's just come from. They have just, they've actually just come back to God. He seems to have completely forgotten that. Number three, I'm the only prophet left, only emphasize big capital letters. And now they, presumably meaning the children of Israel, people of Israel, now they want me dead too. Do they? Really? Last thing we checked, I think they just killed the prophets of Baal, actually. That was the complete opposite. Who was he actually running from? He's actually just running from one woman. That's who, he's, that's who he's actually trying to escape from. He has totally blown the entire thing out of proportion. But 
I tend to find that dwelling on an issue for long enough has a habit of doing that, actually. The longer you spend thinking on it and worrying over it, it just seems to become bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger until it becomes just so overwhelming that you can no longer see the original thing that went wrong. And actually, I think Elijah kind of presented this case to God thinking, well, surely he's going to see it from my perspective. I mean, come on. You know, in, I mean, in Elijah's head, he, I'm sure it sounded totally reasonable. I mean, he's had 40 days to put his case together while he's been walking along. And he's probably been thinking to himself, well, as soon as I get to that mountain, I'm going to give God what for. I'm going to tell him exactly what I think. And this is, you know, the, you know these are all the points I'm going to come across with. And by the time I've finished, God's not going to know what's hit him. I mean, how often do we try to justify our own actions when we're asked, what are you doing here? You know, we sort of say to God, well, no one else knows what I've been through. No one else has ever been there before. This is unique to me. This is unique. No one else in the entire history of mankind has ever suffered the way I'm suffering. You know, it's just, no, it's not fair. It's all about, it's all about me. <laughs> but God's response to Elijah is, Go out and stand before me on the mountain. And we're told that as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by in a mighty wind, when a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire was the sound of a gentle whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. I think the reason that God's initial response was to do those mighty acts was simply because he had to deal with Elijah's perspective. You know, remember who you're talking to, Elijah. Remember whose presence you're in. Wind, earthquake, fire, you know. In some ways, it, it, you can see a few parallels here between Elijah and, and Job's story, you know, where Job is sort of questioning, oh, what's going on with me? Why is this happening to me? What, you know, it's not fair. What are you do, why are you doing this to me, God? And, you know, when you see, when you have that conversation with Job and God, God's response to Job is, well, can you make a giraffe? No. Thought not. You know, it's, it's kind of that thing about, well, in other, in other words, remember, I've got the power. I've got the power here, okay? I have the eternal perspective on all of this, and my view is far, far greater than yours. So he says to him, again, what are you doing here, Elijah? You know, why does God need to ask the question twice? And I think, it, I honestly believe it's because Elijah wasn't ready to hear the answer the first time around. He was too full of anger, he was too full of self-righteous pity at God, and he wasn't able to hear what God actually wanted to say to him. He wasn't ready to listen. But this time, having had his soapbox moment, having had the opportunity to rant, he is now ready. You've got to remember that this is a man who is used to seeing powerful acts of God. We only have to look back a chapter to see that. But this time, it's the whisper that gets his attention. You know, I know I'm often more responsive to God's gentle proddings than I am to mighty acts of power, but I have to be honest, I, I think I tend to still seek those mighty acts of power because they're more obvious and they're more kind of, oh yeah, that's definitely what you're saying to me, God. Because when I'm feeling hard done by and I know that I struggle to hear what God wants to say to me because I just can't see the wood for the trees. Um, you know, and it's a very common human trait. Oswald Chambers, in his book, My Utmost for His Highest, says, we look for visions from heaven and for earth-shaking events to see God's power. Even the fact that we are dejected is proof that we do this. Yet we never realize that all the time, God is at work in our everyday events and in the people around us. If we will only obey and do the task that he has placed closest to us, we will see him. One of the most amazing revelations of God comes to us when we learn that it is in the everyday things of life that we realize the magnificent deity of Jesus Christ. And that God wants our honesty. He doesn't mind our questions. He doesn't mind our anger. But the thing that does matter is our heart attitude when we come with those things. If we're not ready to hear his answer, if we're not ready to humble ourselves before him and recognize that despite what we're facing, he has the eternal vision on it all. 
And if we're not ready for his answer, it's because we are too busy seeking the one that we're looking for and the one that we think is the best way forward. So when Elijah, this time, when God asks him the question, he repeats exactly what he said before. I've zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you. They've torn down your altars. They've killed every one of your prophets, and I'm the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me too. You know, this time, I think the tone is much more humble. And now God can give Elijah the truth from his perspective, and not from Elijah's tiny, narrow view. And God's answer to Elijah's statement is, go back the way you came. I mean, is that what Elijah was expecting or hoping to hear? Not likely, I wouldn't have thought. In fact, I'm sure he was hoping that God was going to say to him, it's okay, Elijah, you don't have to go back. You can spend the rest of your days in peace and safety on this mountain here. How's that sound? I'm sure Elijah would hope, was hoping for that kind of response. But that isn't what God said. And what is God saying? He's actually saying to him, you're not to give up, Elijah. I'm not finished with you yet. There is more for you to do. It's not over. You go back the way you came, and I am going to provide for you. Don't give up. Keep going. And then God goes further, and he gives Elijah the truth about his situation, and he gives him hope for the future, because in verses 15 to 18, we're told that God promises to provide Haziel, Jehu, Elisha, plus 7,000 followers of God who've never bowed down to Baal. You're not on your own, Elijah. You might think you are, but there are actually 7,000 other people who've never, ever worshipped Baal. I have a plan. Jezebel has absolutely no power whatsoever. I am God, and you need to remember that. You know, when I was um, preparing this sermon, I felt that this was a message that someone or maybe more than one person here this morning needed to hear. Maybe you feel like you've been going through an extended time of trial without any answers from God. You've cried out to him, but you've just felt silence when you've asked him to take it all away. Maybe you've tried to justify your response. Maybe you've tried to answer God's question, why are you here, with an answer of your own, but not wanting to hear what it is that he has to actually say. Well, this morning I believe that God wants to meet with you. I believe that... He wants you to hear this. He loves you. He has heard your prayers. And now he says to you, you go back the way you came. Don't give up. Keep going. I will provide for you. Trust me because you are not alone. There is hope for the future. If that is you, then please, I'd ask you not to leave here this morning unless you have spoken with someone that you trust and asked them to pray with you. Because spending that time with God and responding to what he is challenging you over, what the Holy Spirit is prompting in your heart, is more valuable than anything else you can do. But you know, that story, not just my story that I've just shared with you, but the story of Elijah, you know, it clearly teaches us about a God who cares deeply for each of us. In our times of fear and exhaustion, he provides for our needs. He doesn't judge. He doesn't condemn. He just allows us to be honest with him. Having those conversations that provide us with his perspective on our situations. You know, when things seem hopeless and we reach the end of our ropes and we're thinking to ourselves, how is this ever going to turn out good? It reminds us that there is hope. There is a plan. There is a future. And he will make it right. And what he has for you is always good. Should we pray? Father God, I just want to thank you for your mercy. I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your goodness towards us. You are unfailingly good. And although we may not always understand your methods, we may not always understand what it is that you're doing or why you do things the way that you do, I want to thank you that we can trust you We can trust you to work things out for our good. Because that's the God that you are. That's who you are. That's who you said you're going to be. And you will remain faithful. 
Father, I want to pray for every single person who sat here this morning who's found themselves in that place where they're just crying out to you and they don't seem to have any answers and they don't know why you are doing what you're doing in the way that you're doing it. Holy Spirit, would you just send your comfort to their hearts? Would you just remind them that you have got your hand on them? You have got a plan. There is hope. And you are and you will make it right. Even if right now we can't see exactly what it is that you're doing. Father, I just pray that you would use your word just to wherever it lands this morning to touch our hearts and to use us to change the world that we find ourselves interacting with this week. In Jesus' name, amen.